Welcome to our celebration of Yuri's Night. Uh, Yuri's Night was actually April 12th, but this is the nearest Friday, so we're celebrating tonight. Um, and April 12th, 62 years ago to that day, Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. Um, well, while he was in space, he actually ate uh, two servings of meat and one serving of chocolate sauce. But today we have some pizza for you to enjoy, and I think that's quite a lot better. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Mason Peck. Um, professor Mason Peck is a Stephen J. Fujikawa Professor of Astronautics at Cornell University, where he conducts research in spacecraft system architectures. He is the director of the NASA New York Space Grant Consortium, which focuses on NASA relevant space education and workforce development. He's also a former NASA chief technologist who was the agency's lead advisor on technology programs and policy. And he is also the director of the Space Systems Design Studio here at Cornell, um, where I have the pleasure of working under him at the Alpha CubeSat project. So it is my honor today to welcome such an esteemed professor to our lecture series. So without further ado, let's hear a round of applause for Professor Mason Peck. Thanks very much, Gillis, and thanks for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here on a day, I never thought I'd use this phrase, a hot day in April in Ithaca. Uh, but this is an exciting day for a number of reasons. We commemorate an important event in, in our history. Uh, and in addition to looking back and thinking about what that meant for us as a species, um, I think it's helpful to look forward. In particular, I wanna make a point here about innovation and technology and cool stuff. Uh, let me take you for a little ride talking about small spacecraft and really big spacecraft, uh, because it's my contention that as exciting as small spacecraft are, uh, they are nearing their sunset, and you'll see why. Uh, I first of all think of myself as a small spacecraft kind of guy. Gillis uh, referred to the Alpha CubeSat project. That's a, a so-called 1U CubeSat. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter spacecraft uh, that they are designing and building at Cornell, and we're going to launch it very soon, sooner than we might want. Um, this is a video <clears throat> from a spacecraft that launched, uh, a version of it launched in 2014, another version launched in 2017. It's called Kicksat. Uh, Kicksat is so named for Kickstarter, which you know is a crowdfunding website. Uh, in fact, it was the first crowdfunded spacecraft back when it was possible to do that kind of thing. Uh, these days, it's not quite. Uh, you could try. I don't think you'd be successful. But at the time, it was an amazing opportunity. A graduate student named Zach Manchester, who's now on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon, uh, he led the Kickstarter campaign for this, also led the design and uh, build of the spacecraft. He asked the public for $30,000. They responded with $80,000. And with that money, he built not one, but two spacecraft. In fact, it's not even two, it's more like 258 spacecraft. Um, each one of these spacecraft you see, you see one that's uh, kind of longish shape, deploys or sprays out uh, over a hundred other, even smaller spacecraft. Now I have one with me today. It's neat that you can carry spacecraft around, but here's one. Uh, this is, we call it a Sprite. Uh, the Kicksat spacecraft spat out about a hundred and so, uh, so odd, uh, Sprites. I'll pass this around, you, can, you guys can take a look at it. I'd prefer you not take it out of the bag. It is in fact a flight spare that didn't make it into space. So sadly, uh, this one's brothers and sisters made it, but, uh, but they didn't. I'm showing you this video, partly because it's a cool video, uh, but also it's uh, evidence of collaboration. Uh, back in the early 2010s, collaboration in space was not really a thing. Space was not particularly democratized. Sure, there were CubeSats, small spacecraft, um, and what we mean when we say small, it can be a little confusing, but it's through small spacecraft that collaboration really became possible and is now a thing that we do uh, through technology development in space. You can, in fact, collaboratively build a spacecraft and get it launched, as Gillis will do. Uh, you can launch your senior project here at Cornell. But by small, I mean a couple of things. If we use the Air Force's terminology, a so-called mini satellite is somewhere around 100 to 200 kilograms. A microsatellite, somewhere between 10 and 100 kilograms. A nanosatellite, including CubeSats, that's between 1 and 10 kilograms. So Gillis's spacecraft is about 1 kilogram. The Femto and Pico satellite category kind of doesn't really exist, except for what we've done. Now, 
by that logic, uh, if we had built a one gram spacecraft and it's close, what you're seeing there is about three grams. Uh, we would have a so-called Yocto satellite. So the world's kind of fail us because the Air Force mashed multiple orders of magnitude into one, um, but we're not stopping there. Um, one of the things we're trying to do at very small scale is this. This is all the stuff you are seeing on that spacecraft that you're passing around, but on a single integrated circuit, some application specific integrated circuit. Uh, the substrate itself is a solar cell, so it draws power from its own structure. It's got uh, little LEDs on it for propulsion, ask me later. Uh, it also has cameras and other cool stuff. So I'll let you pass that one around too. Um, now I say all that um, because CubeSats and small spacecraft have been the way in which space technology has seen innovation for about a decade now. Even though small spacecraft, I mean CubeSats, uh, really became a real thing in the early 2000s. In fact, Cornell's uh, Ice Cube CubeSat was one of the first launched in 2006. Mark Campbell uh, ran that program. Um, even though they've been around for a long time, it really kind of took hold about 10 years ago. And they've had a good run. What you're seeing here is the number of CubeSats launched by year. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that people use to justify creating little rockets, little launch vehicles. Uh, by the way, there's something like 106 rocket startup companies right now, of which I will be amazed if two of them survive. Nevertheless, uh, this is part of the motivation. The fact that there are hundreds of individual spacecraft launched every year, and that number has been increasing. So rather than bore you with a big old chart, I'm gonna point out a couple of fun things here. Um, first of all, a large fraction of these small spacecraft, even though they're surprisingly cheap, about the cost of an expensive car, um, even though they're surprisingly cheap, most of them are launched by companies, which to my mind suggests they can be the source of entrepreneurial innovation. And that's totally true. There are companies like Planet Labs uh, started about uh, 12 years ago and now does a brisk business in earth observation, taking pictures of the surface of the earth with spacecraft that are no bigger than that projector there. Uh, there are other companies that do something similar. You're probably familiar with SpaceX. You've probably heard of SpaceX, yes? Um, SpaceX has a constellation called Starlink. It's going to provide uh, internet service to virtually everywhere at high speed. Uh, not quite there yet, but it's getting there. They don't quite use CubeSats, but they do use small spacecraft. So one of the things that we see is when you reduce the cost of the thing you're trying to launch, people come out of the woodwork, come up with ways of creatively developing new technologies and then securing investment for them. What you see on this chart is also little red circles. Uh, those indicate when Cornell launched a spacecraft. So we have built many spacecraft over the years, uh, not quite one per year on average for the last decade, but, but pretty close. Um, and we've had some that didn't quite make it. Our first one, 2006, I mentioned already, that was the ICE CubeSat. It did ionospheric studies. Uh, 2013 was CUSAT, which uh, did some in-orbit inspection, you know, like CU, so also Cornell University, followed uh, right afterwards by KickSat 1, which I already showed you a video of. We had KickSat 2 in 2017, uh, coming up soon. I'm sorry, we just launched the PAN spacecraft, the Pathfinder for Autonomous Navigation, which was two spacecraft that launch and then find each other in orbit and dock together. That uh, was a demonstration of technologies that would lead to uh, robotic assembly and manufacturing in space. So I hope what I'm communicating to you here is first of all, how accessible space has become that even a university, even students can play along. There's a couple others listed in the future, right there in 2023, four-ish is uh, the Alpha CubeSat, we hope, followed by some others. So um, CubeSats have been on the rise. But it's not just CubeSats, it's small spacecraft of many types. This is a picture of the Falcon 9, a SpaceX launch vehicle that launched 105 other spacecraft as secondary payloads or rideshare pay payloads. Uh, I showed you KickSat, which launched its own complement of 100 spacecraft, right? That was close to 10 years ago now. This is what we do now. It's suddenly gone up by a factor of about 10,000 in mass. Uh, you can now launch 100 spacecraft, each one of which is itself 10 to 100 kilograms. But that's only the beginning of what I mean when I say big space. When I say big, I mean big in time, space, mass, energy, momentum, charge, you know, any of the fundamental physical quantities. Um, 
when we're able to fabricate spacecraft in orbit, which by the way, we are almost there. Okay, we're within years, a couple of years of being able to build stuff in space. When we can do that from materials that don't have to launch, but maybe we find them on the surface of the moon or on asteroids, maybe even comets. And when we do that with an infrastructure in space, like an internet among planets or refueling stations, when we do that, what do those spacecraft look like? So I'm particularly interested in this as a research question. There are other folks who get paid more than I do who are interested in this as a business question. What is the spacecraft we should be thinking about to take advantage of this remarkable paradigm shift that is upon us right now? Now, I, it's remarkable to me being the old guy in the room here um, because I can look back 20 years and say, this is nothing like what I'm used to. For you guys, you know, you kind of more or less grew up with SpaceX. You think, yeah, well, people build rockets all the time. No big deal. We'll send William Shatner to space. It's, it, it can be done. Um, I'm telling you that that is within the last few years. It's as if the space industry suddenly woke up or the technology world suddenly became aware of what's possible. It's a little bit like uh, being a, a person in the 1960s, which I barely was. I remember in the early 1970s, my dad bought our first color television set, and he did so specifically to watch the Apollo moon landings, which was cool. Um, of course, they were in black and white. Uh, but the surprise for my dad and for so many other people was that Apollo was televised, basically live imagery from space. That doesn't surprise you guys, probably. But you're going to get surprised by a few other things. And let me see if I can surprise you today. So with this question, though, I think this opens up a huge array of possibilities. First of all, opportunities for everybody here to ha have a meaningful contribution to a, an unusual future. How can you, um, what, what should we be anticipating here? What are these future spacecraft going to look like? Quick example, if you're building spacecraft in orbit, you don't need to launch them. That sounds obvious, but almost everything we take for granted about spacecraft is the way it is because it's got to survive launch and it has to be light enough and sturdy enough to be able to launch and survive when it gets there. That is really hard. And that's one of the main reasons why spacecraft are expensive and difficult to design. In the future, and I'm not kidding, we might make spacecraft out of concrete, lunar concrete, or maybe we'll make them out of glass, glass that's spun from lunar regolith. And that's not an outlandish suggestion. If we do that, we'll do so because they don't have to launch. Something like that would be ridiculous to launch from the surface of the Earth. But once it's already in space, maybe no risk. So spacecraft of the future, I think, are going to look as different from spacecraft now as automobiles around the turn of the last century looked compared to the horse-drawn wagons that, that they followed. So big. It's about big. Um, we thought that small spacecraft were revolutionary, and we've been thinking that for several decades. Some folks were ahead of their time. A fellow named Rick Fleeter started a company uh, called Aero Astro. And uh, he had this radical idea in the late 80s of making really small spacecraft and making many of them. He was just barely successful. If he had hung on another decade, <laughs> he would have seen this explosion in small space. That, To some extent, he, he started. Everything we thought was revolutionary about small sats is about to come true for the large ones. Cheap, low risk, and democratized. And here's why. I barely see this. I don't know if we should turn off some lights or something, but uh, you can figure that out. Um, SpaceX, uh, regardless of what you may think of Elon Musk, um, SpaceX has developed a spacecraft. It's called Starship, or at least the upper stage is called Starship. Super heavy is the uh, part below this, a huge amount of fuel. The Starship launch vehicle, I'm going to call it, is capable of far more than any rocket ever. NASA has been working on something called the Space Launch System, SLS, for over a decade. It's projected to cost over $4 billion to launch about 100 metric tons to space. 100 metric tons is a lot of mass. The Starship can launch at least that much. My spies at SpaceX tell me 150 metric tons, and not for $4 billion, maybe $10 million. Now, $10 million is more than I have, probably more than any of you guys have. But let's amortize this across the, the cost of the spacecraft. That turns out to be about $10 per kilogram. So you can launch a car for less than the cost of a car. That is a complete game changer. 
Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Fantastic system is, is rewriting the history textbooks. We've been able to look back to what, 2% of the time since the Big Bang. Amazing outcomes from that thing. But it also costs $12 billion. If you had the Starship to launch it and you could design to that environment, you could probably do that project for about 200 million to 300 million. Still a lot of money but it's not like the astrophysics program at NASA has to mortgage its future for that spacecraft, which they kind of did for James Webb. So this is the kind of game changing I'm talking about. If we reduce the cost to orbit by something like a factor of a thousand, which is roughly what we're talking about. If we do that, what do these spacecraft look like? They don't look like the James Webb Space Telescope. They don't look uh, artisanal and subtle and full of gold and subtlety. Um, they are big blocks of stuff. In fact, it's been proposed, I'm not sure how seriously, it's been proposed that you could take a used terrestrial telescope and launch it on a starship. And you would have a space telescope basically for free. And yeah, you'd launch lots of rocks and dirt and mud and bird crap and whatever into space, but you'd have a space telescope for next to nothing because it's possible. So starship. Um, Lots of things to say about this. Here it is in comparison to some of the launch vehicles you might know. Uh, the, uh, on the left there, one of the Constellation series, I'm sorry, that's uh, SLS. That's the space launch system NASA has been working on for years. And I, I have to try to avoid being cynical here because I'm a huge NASA fan, all right? And in fact, I was at the agency when SLS was just kind of coming up. It was so difficult because everyone saw this as a poor use of money. And I'm not kidding, basically everybody. But you kind of couldn't fight it. And you could, it was an inevitable snowball hurtling down the hill at NASA because, frankly, of the Alabama delegation that just needed to spend the money and create some jobs in their district. It's so sad to me that we could mortgage the future of space science for the sake of some you know, short-term jobs in one person's district. But frankly, that's what SLS has been. I might get quoted here. I might end up on Space News. Who knows? But I'm telling you, that's not going to matter anymore because Starship is so obviously better <laughs> that SLS will be a, a, a distant memory. Uh, there are lots of folks around headquarters who call it the Senate launch system as opposed to space launch system because it's pretty much entirely a political deal. Yeah, it's got some great capabilities and it's already been proven to work and it's going to work great. But do we really need to spend $4 billion to launch something that we could launch for $10 million via SpaceX? I think the answer is pretty clearly no. When this gets operational, that's one reason why it'll be less expensive. Uh, it will launch daily or maybe every couple of days. Now, some of you may remember that that was the plan for the space shuttle, to have really frequent launches, and that never quite panned out either. There's reasons for that. Ask me about it later if you like. Um, but we're almost there with Starship. Another reason that this is possible is that virtually all the Starship and the, and the uh, super heavy upper stage, or the uh, first stage, uh, that's reusable. Now, you're thinking of the space shuttle. Yes, that was more or less reusable. You can enter the atmosphere and you get most of the vehicle back, not all of it. But it took so much effort to rebuild that thing every time that basically $500 million per launch of the space shuttle, which is why the space station cost something like $100 billion. Uh, with Starship, that's a different calculation, um, mainly because mass will no longer be our constraint. And this completely flies in the face of what aerospace engineers think about, right? We are just trained. It's in our DNA to think about minimizing mass. There's this parameter size, weight, and power swap. You want to have low swap. I'm telling you that doesn't matter anymore. And that, that freedom, I think, kind of freaks people out. <laughs> there are careers that have been made in optimizing down to 1% or 2% of the capability of current launch vehicles and spacecraft designed for a world in which they have to be low mass. We can kind of throw out those textbooks. Um, Speaking of teaching, I teach a course here in spacecraft design. Uh, in the early 20-somethings, uh, uh, all the way up to about 2010, 2011, I would revise my lecture notes every year and probably swap out a few pictures and a couple of things that were new. In the last two or three years, I've had to throw away about half of my lecture material and start fresh because of how radically everything has changed and is continuing to change. I expect not to be able to use this presentation for more than a few months because something else is going to happen that's going to completely change our perspective. Nevertheless, mass will no longer be our constraint. So from $4,000 per kilogram to $10 per kilogram post-Starship. 
uh, space station, right? So the Space Transportation System, STS, that's the formal name for the space shuttle, uh, that could take about 29,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Of course, it was also a human rated spacecraft, as Starship will be, by the way. Um, 500 million per mission. Starship, 150,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, maybe 10, maybe 15 million per launch. Um, ISS, the International Space Station, represents about 10 billion just in launch costs. So Starship might have done that in four launches. What took us 20 years might have happened in a week with Starship. So again, big in time, in space, in geometry, in everything. Um, it will completely change what we think about. Now, the thing is that right now, no one's ready to build these massive satellites. You go to, I don't know, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and name your favorite large aerospace contractor if you have any, um, and, and ask them for a satellite, they're going to build the stuff they've been building for the last 30 years. It works great. But there are other companies out there that will soon displace these guys, I'm, I'm confident, unless there's a radical change in how those companies operate. An example is K2 Space. So this slide and the next couple are from a company called K2 Space. So named because the, the founders both have K, as first letter of their last name. So they want to build the massive satellites. They've heard the story. They've uh, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid, maybe I shouldn't say that. They've, they've, they've absorbed the lessons, all right? So that lesson is there is a massive market or will be very soon that exploits the capability of Starship. And it's just stunning that no one's doing it yet, but it's happening. So K2 Space is one such company. The government, US government has also heard the story and they have begun putting out a number of policy documents. This is gonna be slightly boring. So give me a second here. Um, in orbit, servicing, assembly and manufacturing. A lot of what we do when we design spacecraft is design one that only gets fueled up once on the ground. It'd be like driving your car from here to Los Angeles and throwing it away somewhere around Tennessee, because that's it, and got to buy a new car, drive it the rest of the way. Um, that's not efficient, but since it'll cost so little to put propellant into space, like anything, you might as well place propellant depots all over low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, between the Earth and the Moon, between the Earth and Mars, so that spacecraft can be refueled. And that completely changes the calculation. There's a thing called the rocket equation that says, when you uh, burn rocket fuel, you're doing so because you're carrying other rocket fuel you haven't burned yet. So there's this kind of exponential growth in the propellant you need because you're carrying propellant you're gonna need in the future. If you don't need that, you can burn it faster, hotter and refuel and keep going and get places faster. As an example, right now it takes something like seven months to get from the earth to Mars. If you could refuel along the way, probably more like a few weeks. With a few weeks to Mars comes way less risk of radiation damage to people and hardware, uh, less food, water, and other things to carry for humans, less risk to human life overall, more science to be done. It's all good. So that's the S, <laughs> servicing. A in ISAM, assembly. We are right now capable of assembling spacecraft in orbit. The International Space Station is an example, but it was done with a 20th century approach. Um, in the future, we will have robots build that stuff for us. And I'll show you some pictures. Imagine a world in which you need a space station. You call up the uh, robots that build things in space, send what amounts to a 3D printer file to those robots, and they spit out a space station. As crazy as that might sound, that is within about five years of our current capability. M in ISAM is manufacturing. There's a company called Varda Space Industries, which is founded by Cornell students, by the way, uh, that now has something like uh, $200 million in venture capital investment. They are building stuff in space and sending it back to Earth because it's actually cheaper and you can build higher quality products than you can on the Earth. So the use of low Earth orbit or space as a manufacturing hub is already upon us. They're launching their first prototype in a few months. We hope they're successful. When they are, they'll be uh, creating fiber optic cable that is so high performance that you could interconnect the entire continent of the United States without any repeater set, uh, sections or repeater stations. So a huge increase in the performance of the uh, fiber optic eliminates the need and the losses associated with modern um, 
uh, fiber optic cable, the need for these uh, stations. So it's actually cheaper for companies who buy the, that fiber optic cable, and therefore they can afford to spend much more on the cable. So these guys will make money out of selling expensive fiber optic that makes it cheaper to create fiber optic networks. They'll also be doing some stuff with uh, medicine and uh, creating some protein crystals that are high performance, but there are ideas like this that will make space a place where we can do manufacturing. I say will, not because this is some pie in the sky idea. As I said, Varda Space Industry exists. It's one of several, by the way, companies who are doing these kinds of things. This is on the horizon. Now, when I was at NASA, uh, an amazing experience, by the way, I will not only never forget it, but I'm very proud of what I was able to do in some small capacity to serve the nation, working closely with the White House. Uh, this was during the Obama administration. There was a lot of energy to do new stuff and cool stuff. I think we made an impact. One of the things we tried to do, and I'm gonna claim was ahead of its time, was to get the National Academies uh, to create a policy for 3D printing in space. So 2014, we tried doing this. This was me and uh, uh, Doug Berman, who was the head of uh, the uh, Space Command in Nevada. We thought this would make sense as a priority for the nation. We were wrong by probably eight years. Um, the phrase we came up with, which I love, is that all the mass we need for a sustainable future in space is already up there. It's just in the wrong shape. And that's about right. You guys have mostly encountered 3D printing in some capacity. Maybe some of you even own a 3D printer. Probably some of you have used them at Cornell. Uh, that is a small version of the kinds of things we're talking about. I'll show you some pictures. This is one called SpiderFab. It's an, a program that NASA has been funding for some years. Uh, with these containers, the, the white cylinders of material of, uh, of raw uh, feedstock, they can create large structures in space. So if you want to accomplish something extraordinary in science and space, generally you need aperture, whether that's for optics or radio waves or something, you need aperture. The more aperture, the more photons you collect, and also the more finely resolved you can get uh, angular, uh, uh, the more finely angularly resolved you can get pictures. So the Hubble Space Telescope with its huge mirror um, uh, was able to capture, I think, um, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, uh, was able to capture data that's only about 1 50th as good as the uh, James Webb because of just the relative aperture size. In the case of something like this, you could build a, let's say, 100 meter class space telescope for the cost of James Webb, which could in fact return images of extrasolar planets, not just the light curves, not just the transit data, not just that kind of stuff, which is important and good, um, but actually a picture. So if so you could do spectral analysis of whatever's on the surface of the extrasolar planet. So we are that close <laughs> to being able to do that kind of science. And it's all thanks to the technology of in-space assembly and manufacturing, part of which is enabled by really low cost launch. But this is not entirely new. We've had 3D printers in space before. This is a picture of one on the International Space Station. So the story goes that uh, Butch Wilmore here, shown holding a 3D printed object, was complaining one day that he needed a ratchet. Now a company called Made in Space, which is a great name, had put a 3D printer on the International Space Station uh, some months before, and it was testing it out to see if it works in microgravity, and it did. Uh, somehow, someone in, at, uh, at NASA heard uh, Butch's complaint, talked to the Made in Space people. They quietly, overnight, came up with a design for a ratchet that could be 3D printed with little internal gears and all the stuff that works. They printed it on the printer and had Butch go over and take the thing off the printer. And then they uh, talked to him and said, well, here's your ratchet. That tells an important story. What it says is that it's kind of like having a transporter beam or maybe a, a replicator if you're a next generation Star Trek fan. Um, we have the ability to change mass in space into what we want it to be. A fundamental engineering desire, right? We see the natural world, we don't like it, we want to change it into something else. Um, that's 3D printing. And that's what I'm suggesting is now possible at very large scale. So spider fab is still some years off, but the less expensive launches become, the more readily companies will be able to invest in things like this and it'll accelerate the rate of technology investment. So there's some strategic goals here, which I'm not gonna bore you with, but I will uh, mention one of the many aspects of space infrastructure that's coming up, which will kind of blow your mind. So who's seen The Martian somewhere? Okay, great. You know this movie. Um, uh, 
the, the, the story goes that this astronaut is marooned on Mars because he can't communicate when he's in fact alive and people think he's dead and he ends up having to spend over a year growing his own potatoes or something like that to keep himself alive, right? Cool story, interesting, uh, and there's reasons to, to object to some of the technical details, but it's an interesting story in what the current uh, technological environment leads to when you're talking about human exploration. The MacGuffin here, the, the main little twist in the story is he can't call home. And if you remember the movie, there's all sorts of shenanigans, machinations he goes through to, to actually come up with a way of communicating with folks uh, back at, in Houston. But that's not the future. In fact, where we are right now is Nokia has been contracted by NASA for two years to build an interplanetary smartphone or cell phone network, specifically using LTE, and it'll be the 4G protocol. So rather than trying to kludge together parts from an old Mars lander, um, like Mark Watney did in the movie, you just pick up your smartphone and call. What that means for space communications is all the untold millions and billions that we are currently spending on things like NASA's deep space network or space hardware that needs to survive all sorts of difficult conditions, that's gonna go away when all you have to do is make a call. So the extent to which you use uh, 3G data on your, or, or, 4, or 5G data on your phone right now, that's how spacecraft, that's how rovers will be communicating going forward. And this is now, I'm telling you, Nokia is doing this, they're building this. I think an interesting opportunity would be to build those smartphones that will actually speak on that network. Eventually, when that network's up and running, someone's going to jump on that. I think it's an interesting entrepreneurial opportunity. But that's not even all. Uh, this is a picture of the Orbital Reef by Blue Origin, a company started by uh, Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon fame and also one of my favorite science fiction authors, Neil Stevenson. Uh, this is a space station, but a commercial one. In fact, it's a business park for space. The idea is they're gonna lease out space and other facilities for people to do in space manufacturing. Now the International Space Station you might think could have done or would do this, and yeah, maybe, but it's due to retire in a few years and it's necessary, it's getting old, right? This is the 21st century of a space station. It's one that's got commerce behind it, industry behind it, and if it's profitable, it'll just continue to grow and lead to all sorts of interesting opportunities for everybody. Um, a quick example of what I mean by big space. So I mentioned James Webb Space Telescope, and this is not a lecture about James Webb, it's barely a lecture about science, um, but it is a lecture about the future. So James Webb is shown on the left there, uh, $12 billion roughly. I mean, the official number is 11.8 billion, but you know. So um, it's complicated uh, and it works great. And those two things go together to make it very expensive. When we launch a spacecraft these days, it's got to work right the first time. And what's particularly challenging is that every spacecraft we launch is probably the first time this thing has ever existed, ever. So it's never existed before and it's got to work perfectly. It's got to work perfectly for like 15 years. That is a tall order from a technical perspective. And that's why it takes a lot of money and testing and exquisite parts and reliability to make it all possible. So I'm in no way claiming that James Webb is a failure. It's obviously a success, but it's a success in the 20th century paradigm. Here is a picture of the James Webb Space Telescope in the fairing of the SpaceX Starship. There's a little extra space, right? That's first, the first thing to notice. How about this as a James Webb-like design? What if you built a single monolithic six meter telescope? Now, not one that folds out in a bunch of little hexagons, but one big old slug of glass. Seems totally doable. After all, we have 150 metric tons to work with here. So I can put a big old slug of glass in orbit if I want to. I don't have to deploy anything. That is, I don't have to come up with some very subtle way in which the uh, hardware kind of unfolds and carefully gets aligned and all this stuff. Difficult to do and expensive. And it has to work right the first time. So we won't do any of that. We'll launch it as it's supposed to operate. The James Webb Space Telescope right now is made out of extremely sophisticated and lightweight materials, uh, carbon fiber composites which you've probably encountered on some sports equipment or a bicycle, right? It's the super lightweight stuff. You knock on it, it sounds a little like metal, but it's super stiff, right? Great stuff. And really expensive to make in complicated shapes. 
There's also material been around since the 40s, I think, called INVAR, that means uh, invariant. It's uh, an alloy that does not change shape as its temperature changes. Now, composites do. You put a composite in the sun, and by the way, if it gets too hot, it'll just plain melt and fail completely. But if it doesn't do that, it might swell or warp. And if you warp or swell the shape of a space antenna or a space telescope, you get bad pictures. So we don't want that stuff. If you used INVAR, it wouldn't happen that way. And by the way, remember, our INVAR structure is holding this big old hunk of glass. So this is a dumb as a bag of hammers kind of a space telescope. But because it's so dumb, it's, it's smart. <laughs> it's smart in that it solves the right problem. The right problem is not how do we make a lightweight spacecraft. The right problem is how do we get space science? And the cheaper it is, the more science we can do. You might even go farther than what I'm suggesting. Rather than just make this space telescope out of the simplest possible but heavy parts, maybe you don't even really design and test it the way we normally do. We predict the performance of these spacecraft using extremely detailed models. And we do extraordinarily difficult tests to ensure that in space, which is not what we can do on the ground, but in space, it will work the right way. Rather than that, why don't we build some prototype version of it, launch it, See what happens. If it doesn't work, well, bring it back down again. We'll fix it, launch it again. This is basically what Detroit does in building a new automobile. You try it out, it doesn't work, fix it, keep going. Remember, launch is like $10 million. That is approximately one one thousandth the cost of the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'm going to suggest there's room to try that. You could just see what happens. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, fix it. That is not the way we do aerospace now. Furthermore, it doesn't need to last for 15 years. This thing might go out to the Lagrange point, which is where James Webb is, or it might go somewhere else. But since you can repair it now, the hardware only needs to last a short time. In fact, the main thing that screws up space hardware is radiation in the environment. If you can swap out the hardware every few years, maybe even months or, or weeks, you could use off the shelf stuff. You could use Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, and you could go get your parts at SparkFun and, and uh, you know, the a target, right? Uh, you could put cell phone guts inside, inside your spacecraft, and you don't mind because you can always swap them out when it breaks. So philosophically, a completely new world. In this new world, what opportunities will we have? I will leave you with uh, a provocative possibility. Cornell's, Cornell's lunar, lunar campus is closer, closer than, than you think. think. It's where, it's you, where you can undertake research that simply isn't, isn't possible, possible on Earth. Earth. Prototyping, Prototyping the technologies, technologies that will enable a permanent human presence. Studying, studying the surface and its, and its eons eons long, record long record of the solar system. system. Detecting, detecting long wavelength, wavelength signals from, from distant, distant galaxies. And building, and building the foundation for the next century's discoveries on the moon, on Mars, on Mars and beyond. Our engineering, our engineering students, students execute their design senior projects design projects 382,000 kilometers away from New, away from New York as remote, as remote robotic, robotic experiments. Some of them, some of them even spend a semester in Cornell's, in Cornell's module, module as part of NASA's, part of NASA's international, international lunar habitat. habitat. There, there, on the South Pole, the South Pole near the Aiken, near the Aiken Basin, Basin, there's already, there's already supply of water and power, and power thanks to permanently, thanks to permanently shadowed, shadowed and sunlit, and sunlit regions. regions. The Cornell, the Cornell Lunar, Lunar Campus, campus is a capstone experience for our students, like no other, like no other. First the university first on university on the moon, and, and it's closer, it's than, closer you than you'd think. We're provocative, but maybe not that far off, maybe closer than you think. Thanks for your time, glad to take some questions. All right, who's got a question? Or an insult? Oh. All right, I can try to run this around to everybody. <laughs> um, in the case of in-space servicing, wouldn't the propellant depots also be subject to the rocket problem? 
Absolutely, yes. And so, yeah, you do have to spend money and propellant to get the uh, propellant depots into space. The, the point that uh, I think I'm interested in here is once it's up there, then uh, you can refuel other spacecraft. And since what's really valuable is the payload on the spacecraft, right? The science payload or whatever it might be, that's really what you want to give the propellant to. Uh, so this is basically analogous to the infrastructure we have on Earth uh, in the form of gas stations, right? You, you spend a lot of money on a car and the propellant is sort of an, or the gas is kind of an afterthought. You know, it's maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 gallons, depending on your, your tank. You don't really think about the cost of buying a tank of gas when you buy a car. There is this infrastructure that exists. I'm not sure how much it costs to build a gas station. I'm thinking one or $2 million, maybe, I don't know. But uh, however much that costs, that, that infrastructure is in place to service the fleet of cars. And the bigger point here is it's a matter of sustainability. The way we are doing space now, it's kind of like the old Conestoga wagon model, where you throw your, your kids and your old your good old bulldog Jack and some salt park in the back of the, uh, the, the wagon, and you head off across the mountains to California, and, and good luck to you, and you, you know, that's it. That idea of being sort of alone, without a community to support you, or without an infrastructure to enable you, that is becoming the past. Uh, with the infrastructure of propellant depots, so much more is possible in the same way that you can now drive your car to California, um, you would potentially be able to uh, drive your science spacecraft to Mars for much less at the end of the day. So that's, that's one reason why, to, why you would do this. But you're right, it does cost something to put the propellant in space. And yet, um, again, another message here is with Starship, that's gonna be so inexpensive, we don't really mind. It's a little bit like, again, a gas station where there's a truck that pulls up with a big tank full of gas and unloads it in the gas station, same thing in space. You'll just keep replenishing these propellant depots with more propellant, maybe launched by Starship or some other rocket that has, you know, gotten the memo on how to do it cheaply. Does that kind of address the question? Okay. What else you got? Hi. Uh, I was wondering, I kind of forgot the technical name for this, but I know it could be an issue if there was a lot of stuff kind of in orbit, uh, if something were to go wrong and create debris, you know, you could cause a chain reaction. I was wondering if that's something that's been thought about. It's a wonderful question. Thank you. So the, the, you're thinking of orbital debris, right? Some people call it space junk, but orbital debris is the uh, official term. So now you have the official term. Um, uh, you're 100% right that with more activity in space comes more space debris. Um, almost all of the space debris that exists right now comes from two sources. It's very old uh, rocket bodies, they're called stages from spent rockets from the 1970s, roughly, mostly from Russia, France, one or two from the US, one or two from China, and uh, two or three explosions that happened because of military tests by Russia and China uh, in orbit that caused huge debris clouds. I'm calling them out here because it's an incredibly irresponsible use of this uh, precious resource, which is a clean space environment. There are plenty of uh, international agreements and treaties in place to ensure that at least if the rules are followed, that space stays more or less clean and safe. Uh, now, at the moment, treaties prevent uh, companies and individual countries from cleaning up others' debris. Uh, I'm not gonna comment on China and risk being political, but I will comment on the former Soviet Union, which doesn't really exist. And so if you were to ask Russia uh, hey, can I go ahead and clean up some of that Soviet debris, or could you please go ahead and do it since it's your own fault? They would say, well, we're not the Soviet Union. Uh, that's not our problem. Uh, and also, by the way, we don't have the right to do it in the U.S. because we can't get the Soviet Union's permission. This is kind of a nutty treaty-related problem. It will take uh, the U.N. Uh, changing the rules in order for that to be possible. And frankly, there's got to be a profit motive because it's very expensive to remove orbital debris. You're referring to also the so-called Kessler syndrome. The Kessler syndrome is this phenomenon where as things collide, they produce more debris. And the more debris they produce, the more collisions happen, either with that same bunch of debris or with other pieces of debris. And it eventually forms a ring around Earth of debris like Saturn uh, or Neptune or Jupiter. So the, that debris is of huge concern. And we're at the point right now where the Kessler syndrome has started to kick in. We're seeing the growth of objects exactly following the prediction of Mr. Kessler. And uh, the way to, to stanch that flow is to get rid of the large rocket bodies. The little things, the little bits of debris, first of all, you can't really get them anyway. 
and second, uh, it's just way too expensive. And they will enter on their own because the smaller something is, the more pronounced the effect of atmospheric drag is versus gravity, and it'll just come right back down more or less on its own. So low Earth orbit will get cleaned up by virtue of physics. The real risk is the higher stuff, certainly geostationary orbit. So I think you've heard of geostationary orbit. It's the orbit where a satellite rotates, orbits around the Earth at the same speed as the Earth rotates. So it's a valuable place. Uh, first popularized by Arthur C. Clarke, by the way. That um, orbit, if orbital debris ends up there, is going to be crippling for communications, for you know, commercial and for uh, military communications. So we'd like to avoid that. So I think to your larger point, isn't this huge growth in in space manufacturing and everything else going to add debris? I'm sure that it will. At the same time, a lot of folks have a stake in keeping that clean now that probably didn't before. So maybe these two forces balance themselves out. I don't really have a prediction, but I think you're absolutely right. It's something to keep an eye on. All right, I'll run to the back. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I'll turn it off before I run by that next time. Hi, um, you were saying that SpaceX is going to launch just about every day. How much fuel is that going to use? <clears throat> Which part? <laughs> uh, you, you had said that SpaceX is going to launch every day. How much fuel will that use every day? So I don't mean to be facetious, but about that much. I mean, that, that stage is pretty much all propellant. Um, so I'm going to estimate it's several um, tanker cars worth of fuel. Uh, so I believe it's liquid oxygen and kerosene. So it is a hydrocarbon. So that's going to lead to greenhouse gases. But also let's remember that as, as huge as that is, it is absolutely negligible compared to gas powered cars and trains and boats and airplanes and everything else. Um, I, I, I could do the calculation, not, not, not right now, but maybe we can talk about it later. I'm very confident that this is a tiny fraction of the total hydrocarbons put into the atmosphere. Now, one of the challenges might be that these, uh, this does put hydrocarbons in the upper atmosphere, as opposed to like right down uh, where we are, which, which it does. Now, but not all rockets use that combination. In fact, a lot of rockets use hydrogen and oxygen propellant. And of course, when you burn hydrogen and oxygen, you get water. And that's pretty green from that perspective. I do agree that this is not a 100% green process, but it could be worse. Uh, how like, oh, how will a deep state a space crewed Starship mission uh protect its astronauts from the radiation in the Van Allen belts? Was question was, um, uh, how will the deep space crew survive the radiation environment, uh, right? And there are several things to say about that. One is planets tend to protect people. So we are protected to a large degree on Earth from the Earth's atmosphere itself and also from the magnetic field of Earth, which deflects some high energy particles and makes us a little bit safer. So on Earth, we are helped by the environment. Uh, and by the way, the uh, half of the Earth that's below you right now is also protecting you from radiation coming from space, right? So anytime you're on a planet, you at least get half, uh, if not more, uh, I'm sorry, you, you get less than half of the radiation dose that you would have in space, all things being equal. But in practice, um, the faster, so the, the faster you go from one place to the next, the less you're exposed to radiation. Now you mentioned the Van Allen belts, and that's absolutely true that in, uh, around the Earth, <clears throat> there are these uh, belts of high radiation where the magnetic field and the spin of the earth and the sun's behavior conspire to put a lot of high energy particles there. If a crew is traveling from earth to the moon or earth to Mars, uh, they'll pass through the Van Allen belts in the matter of 
probably hours, if not less. So it's a very small dosage. At the end of the day, the number you care about is the total dosage. Um, and so it has to do with how long you are subject or exposed to the radiation and um, you know, the strength of the radiation. Near a planet, like I say, it's more, way more benign than deep space. You're right about the Van Allen belts, but I'll tell you that one of the best ways I can think of to shield against radiation actually ties in pretty well with making spacecraft sustainable. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the most popular rocket propellants is hydrogen and oxygen, right? So you combust that, you get water. People need water to drink. Uh, they need water to bathe. They need water or could use water as a, like a fluid in a radiator or cooling system, a water maybe to grow plants. Um, water is useful for many things. One of them, it's things it's useful for is shielding against radiation. So a really interesting design for a spacecraft, especially one where speed people will be on board for a long time, will be one in which the propellant tank, the fuel tank, is not just a little ball in the middle of the spacecraft, it's actually a shell around the entire spacecraft. So if you surround the spacecraft with a shell of water, you'll protect people from radiation, you will also have a ready supply of propellant and drinking water and everything else. It shouldn't surprise us that one of the main ways in which we can be successful and thrive in space is to make space look more like Earth. And on Earth, water is kind of everything for life. So add water to a spacecraft, you have a much more Earth-like spacecraft. And in fact, it turns out one that actually protects you from radiation as well. If you don't like the idea of a huge tank of water surrounding the spacecraft, if I were you, and if I were designing a spacesuit, which I'm sure you're gonna do someday, make the helmet the same sort of idea. So create a helmet with a like a, like a fishbowl of water kind of surrounding uh, your head. At least that'll prevent brain cancer to an extent. You know, it's uh, a much longer off might be some future in which we can actually adjust how humans respond to radiation to prevent cancer. We're not there yet, but from a purely technological perspective, shielding is pretty much the only answer. So you mentioned how some orbital positions are better than others, especially for like certain satellites. How do you think they're going to end up choosing who gets those positions? Like, are they going to end up selling those positions? How could you sell something when it's space and it's not owned by anyone? It might not surprise you to learn that there is a field of law called space law. You can, in fact, be a space lawyer. It's a thing. Uh, it's just true. Uh, George Washington University has a whole space policy institute, and space law is what they practice there. So uh, one of the tenets of space law is exactly what you said, which is uh, that you can't own space. That is to say, you can't own locations in space. Um, but you can own the things you take from space. So back in 2014, the US and also I think Luxembourg uh, passed some legislation that said that it's okay to take things from a planet and keep them, which was always a bit of a question, like say, for example, for the Apollo samples or any future samples we bring back from Mars or comets or asteroids, you know, who gets those? The answer is whoever takes them gets to keep them. As long as you're not laying claim to the actual you know, moon, let's say. So when the US planted a flag on the moon, that caused some consternation, but the plaque on the Apollo lander said, we came in peace for all mankind. Today we would say humanity, but at the time that made some sense. It was actually meant to, to defuse what was a bit of a policy bomb there by putting the flag on there. Anyway, to your point, um, the, so you can't own space but there are organizations that coordinate the use of orbital slots. I'm gonna get this wrong. I think it's the International Telecommunications Union that coordinates who gets to use what geostationary slot. It's like all sorts of other kind of, you know, policy constructs that we all buy into. We all sort of more or less agree that borders are borders and, you know, money does what money does and these rules govern our behaviors. And so as long as people kind of buy into that, we don't get wars and we don't get battles in space. Uh, so yeah, there is in fact already a, uh, a body that controls the, uh, coordinates the use of those geostationary slots. For communications, uh, that is to say the use of the radio spectrum, there are other uh, entities as well. The US has the Federal Communications uh, Commission and there's others that coordinate so that 
you're not transmitting or, or receiving on the same frequency as other people are when they're close by. So there is an effort to sort of de deconflict the use of space. Uh, and that has worked out well so far. But in a future where there's a lot of corporate, you know, jostling around, I don't know what's going to happen. It's a really interesting question. And the whole field of space law might well turn into more like a, a corporate law thing than the government uh, framed set of disciplines that it is right now. So that's a wonderful question. And I, if you're going to be a space lawyer, you let me know how that comes out in another 10 years. Probably have to wrap it up. Right? Um, I think we have time for these last two questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, two more questions and that'll be the end. Okay. So I know Starship is planning to have uh, rocket powered landings. And that's something that's very uh, uncommon now for, for spacecraft. So how is, is SpaceX going to be able to human rate uh, the, Starship, the Starship rocket with the unconventional landing system? I mean, I, they've, they've, done, they've done Falcon 9 landings, but they're still maybe only like 90%-ish uh, on the, the proportion of successful landings. So it's an excellent observation. Anytime you create some kind of uh, strange new technology, particularly when there are people involved, you gotta be particularly careful about how uh, that's gonna actually operate. So NASA has a whole process for human rating vehicles and they will go through that process. I don't know where they are right now in that process, but I've heard that the plan is to send humans in a starship as early as next year. So that implies that they've got the human rating process pretty well underway and they will be you know, happy enough to do that at that point. Uh, so. Your implication, though, was that the um, the retro rocket landing <clears throat> is somehow riskier than other things. I don't. I'm not sure that that's a general statement. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that that's been proven out by uh, the facts. A um, little hard to say, right? But if you look at all the human uh, spacecraft that have entered the atmosphere and, and landed, um, you know, one of them, the space shuttle, the Colum Columbia, yeah, Columbia, uh, burned up on on entry. Uh, there have been other examples, particularly for the, uh, the Soviet uh, Soyuz capsule, which lands on the ground, by the way, it doesn't land in the ocean, uh, that have injured people because of the very hard landing. There was also the potentially apocryphal example of Gus Grissom uh, during the Apollo era landing and his uh, capsule sinking. Uh, he claimed that water was coming in. It wasn't clear that that was true. But anyway, the capsule was lost. So the statistics of human landing are not that great anyway, <laughs> as it currently stands. And the retro rocket um, aspect has not really been responsible yet, but of course no one's done it. As far as the retro rocket, uh, retro propulsion stuff, uh, that's been uh, a thing since a long time ago. There was a program called the Delta Clipper back in the early 90s, which actually did that same kind of retro rocket landing. So this basic technology has been in place for a while. There's been some smaller companies too, uh, let's see, Maston Space, Aerospace, uh, created a, a rocket that landed exactly that way. It wasn't human rated, but again, that aspect of it is pretty mature technology. I will tell you that that's the key, though, to the low cost of Starship, is the fact that it does that rocket, uh, that sort of pr uh, propulsive descent. Um, that saves money, even though it's less efficient from a propellant perspective. You have to carry all that mass of propellant up to space and then back down again. So that's heavier, but it's cheaper in the long run. At the end of the day, you care about cheap. You don't necessarily care about heavy. Heavy itself is not a problem as long as it's inexpensive. The other cool thing that uh, SpaceX is doing, you may have seen this, they've created this structure called the Mechazilla. It's a robotic arm that grabs the rocket out of the air and puts it back on the landing pad. So all of the, let's say, landing gear or other hardware you would have needed to have the Starship land perfectly and not fall over and everything else, that's gone. There's none of that on the Starship. It never has to actually land. It's just caught by Mechazilla. And of course, it stops. The point being, though, that you save all that mass, and potentially you save the risk of an object that could easily topple over. And that toppling over, by the way, that's what killed the Delta Clipper program. One of the um, uh, landing gear failed, and the whole thing just tipped over, and that was it. Blew up. All done. Um, so maybe not a great answer to your question, because I don't think that the, I think the jury is still out on that. But also, I don't see any obvious impediments um, they will just have to go through the qualification process. So I think we're kind of uh, at our time. I think we probably need to. Oh, yeah.
I'll give you a two word answer. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, everybody make sure to gather all the space candy and stickers that you want. I'll just be quick then. Um, so are you concerned? I mean, you did mention that there was a great potential for industry, but are you concerned that with the sudden drop in prices, there may be an effect where uh, supply outstrips demand, i.e. there's way too much capacity and something like SpaceX just goes under because they're trying to launch one a week and there's no way anyone could use that for the next 20 years. That just the possibilities haven't been fully explored. I mean, that's what happened with aluminum, if you think about it. I promise a two-word answer, I'll give you three. First word is no, and the other two are corporate strategy. So SpaceX will uh, adjust its cadence to meet the market. And you're right that that will probably drive up the cost if they're launching less frequently. All right, so thank you all for coming today. If you wanna grab any last slices of pizza, uh, be sure to do that now before we clean up. We'll all be heading to the observatory after we clean up here. Uh, we've got a few members over there already if you wanna head over. Uh, we'll be doing observing through our big historic telescope, the Irving Porter Church Memorial Telescope. Um, I'll also be giving a short lecture on the history of human space flight, um, time to be determined once we clean everything up over here. Uh, but if you want to catch that, it'll also be up at the observatory. So thank you all for coming tonight. Enjoy the rest of your Yuri's night.